Welcome back to the third session of the first day of the science program of the 35th Annual Family Conference of the National MPS Society. If you're just joining us, my name is Matthew Ellenwood. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer for the Society. And I'm excited to introduce a wonderful session uh, to wrap up today with. So today's session is really going to focus on some exciting developments in clinical application involving clinical trials and also the ever important issue of finding important and actionable uh, biomarkers of response to disease. So our first presentation will focus on an in utero uh, clinical trial. And our speaker is Dr. Tippy McKenzie, who is uh, a surgeon by training, but focuses on uh, maternal uh, fetal health issues, transfusions, et cetera. And she is going to, she's at the University of California in San, Diego, uh, in San Francisco. And she'll be talking today about a very exciting uh, clinical trial for in utero delivery of enzyme replacement therapy for MPS 1, 2, 4A, 6, and 7. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Tippy McKenzie to speak to us today. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to be a part of this exciting meeting. My name is Tippy McKenzie, and I'm a pediatric and fetal surgeon at UCSF. And I'm going to tell you about a prenatal enzyme replacement therapy clinical trial. It's a phase one international clinical trial. These are my disclosures. I have uh, research funding currently from Novartis and Biomarin. I've uh, received research fund funding from Altergenics, uh, which funded the enzyme replacement therapy work that I will tell you about. And I'm on the scientific advisory board of a gene editing company called Aquagen. So the fetus used to be this mysterious, elusive being that we met only after birth. But in the 1980s, with the advent of ultrasound, we started being able to peek in on the fetus uh, before birth. And this actually ushered in a whole new field of medicine called fetal surgery. And it was invented right here at UCSF uh, by a brilliant uh, pediatric surgeon named uh, Dr. Mike Harrison. And today there are fetal treatment centers uh, all over the world doing a range of uh, operations, uh, usually for structural or anatomic problems. So this is kind of the range of uh, things we're able to do for prenatal therapy right now. Uh, and like anything in medicine, we're really moving uh, from the world of open fetal surgery, which is what we're doing for uh, things like spina bifida to less and less invasive things like uh, laparoscopic or fetoscopic surgery, catheter-based interventions. And what I'm really excited about is medical treatments for genetic conditions uh, using things like stem cell transplantation or enzyme replacement therapy or gene therapy. Uh, and these therapies can actually be delivered right into the umbilical vein of the fetus using just ultrasound guidance, uh, using a very common procedure that we do for blood transfusions uh, routinely in pregnancy for patients who have RH incompatibility between the mother and the fetus. And there are lots of maternal fetal medicine or obstet obstetric doctors who know how to do this uh, umbilical vein procedure. So as I mentioned, we already do routine prenatal diagnosis uh, for anatomic conditions uh, using ultrasounds. Uh, but if you think about it, this is uh, just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there are a lot more genetic conditions uh, in the fetus uh, that could be diagnosed. Uh, and right now, uh, we only uh, really recommend carrier screening uh, for a handful of conditions. Uh, and if there's a family history or, or other reason to test, we can test the fetus using chorionic villus sampling or sampling of the placenta or um, sampling the amniotic fluid. Uh, and for certain conditions like Down syndrome, the, there are blood tests that can um, look for the chromosomal uh, issues uh, in the mother's blood. Now you may ask yourself, um, why would you want to diagnose a disease before birth when it wouldn't necessarily change what you would think about the pregnancy? Uh, and there are two main reasons for this. One is that um, early prenatal diagnosis can actually uh, help you coordinate the postnatal therapy uh, for the child. 
You can coordinate delivery, for example, um, at a specialized center that has um, uh, the various specialists that the child might need. Uh, you can actually meet with those uh, doctors and specialists uh, uh, during pregnancy and learn more about the condition and, uh, and have a better idea of what to expect. Uh, and you can even get started on insurance approvals for costly therapies. And in some conditions, uh, actually prenatal therapy might improve uh, the outcomes. Um, the fetus uh, is a really um, wonderful uh, environment for uh, prenatal therapy. Uh, one uh, is you can you know, potentially prevent organ damage uh, for conditions that start before birth, uh, like many MPS diseases. Um, the fetus has a very unique and naive immune system, so you can potentially uh, induce what we call tolerance uh, to certain proteins uh, so that the, 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 uh, the child after birth doesn't develop an allergic reaction to a new protein. And there's also no blood brain barrier. So the medicines that we give uh, can potentially better cross into the brain and uh, treat the neurologic problems. And this is actually a really exciting time to be uh, thinking about prenatal therapy for genetic diseases uh, because of this convergence, a unique convergence of uh, technologies and ideas. Uh, so uh, we can now do rapid genetic diagnosis uh, for many diseases. We can even sequence your, sequence your entire genome uh, in a matter of days sometimes. The fetal surgery field, as I said, uh, has really expanded and disseminated all over the world. Uh, and there are new medications uh, and even gene therapies being developed for a number of diseases. So the number of techniques that we can use to treat uh, genetic diseases before birth um, include the ones I've listed here. Uh, stem cell transplantation can be used and we're actually running uh, another phase one clinical trial for uh, blood disorders. Uh, enzyme replacement therapy, which is what I'm uh, going to be talking to you about today. Uh, and then there's a, a lot of really uh, exciting uh, work in development uh, for gene therapy or genome editing for genetic diseases. Uh, these are uh, just on animal models and nothing is really ready for prime time yet uh, for clinical applications. Uh, so I'll focus on enzyme replacement therapy for today. So uh, you guys are all experts in MPS disorders. Uh, and so I won't give a background on that, but uh, just to, to talk a little bit about why we might want to treat an MPS disorder before birth. Um, number one is uh, sometimes uh, fetuses with MPS disorders, uh, most notably MPS7, don't actually survive to birth. Uh, they get sick um, as fetuses, and we can follow them actually getting sicker and sicker on ultrasound. Uh, and sadly, there's nothing we can do um, uh, before this trial for that. Uh, number two is uh, a number of uh, children can develop uh, antibodies uh, against the enzyme, the recombinant enzyme replacement therapy, which their body sees as foreign because um, their body doesn't usually make it. Uh, and so by giving the enzyme before birth, you could potentially induce tolerance, so prevent the development of those anti-drug antibodies. Number three, you can potentially deliver enzyme to the brain before the blood-brain barrier has formed. Uh, and number four, you can pre uh, potentially prevent organ damage, uh, most notably the heart and the liver, uh, which are some of the organs that are already damaged at the time of birth for some diseases. So uh, we wanted to test this, uh, uh, test this idea in, uh, in mice. And so in my lab, um, uh, we did uh, an in utero enzyme replacement therapy uh, experiment uh, that was led by two really talented students, uh, Russell Witt and Ki Nguyen. Uh, and what we did was uh, we took uh, mice with MPS7 uh, and we, um, we did the fetal enzyme injection, which we can do pretty easily in the lab. Uh, and then after the mice were born, we continued to give them uh, recombinant enzyme every few weeks after birth. And uh, at the end of the experiment, we analyzed um, for a number of different things like survival and organ damage bone length, um, did they develop antibodies, and what were the neurologic outcomes? So this experiment worked incredibly well. It was sort of beyond our wildest expectations. Um, and I'll show you uh, some of the results here. Uh, one is that the, the mice with MPS7 also died before birth, and we had uh, much improved survival. We had uh, improved um, histology, which is the level of organ damage that you can see on slides. And what you're looking at here is that in the untreated animal, 
uh, there are these um, little white areas, which are the vacuoles that build up. Uh, but with the enzyme replacement therapy given before and then also after, after, after birth, we didn't see that. And you can see it also graphed here um, where there were a lot more of these vacuoles in the untreated animals uh, compared to the treated animals. We measured their bones and we saw that they had improved bone length. We saw that the enzyme penetrated into the brain uh, and especially into the cells in the brain called microglia, which are the really important storehouses of this enzyme. And we also induce tolerance to the enzyme. So uh, based on these um, uh, interesting results, we wanted to develop a safe protocol for in utero enzyme replacement therapy. Uh, and the heroes here were Dr. Paul Harmetz, who's an expert on uh, MPS and lysosomal storage disorders. Um, he's one of my colleagues at Children's Hospital, um, Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland, as well as Marissa, who is a surgery resident, a student working with us. Uh, we had conversations with na national and international experts. Uh, we surveyed patient groups such as you, the MPS Society, as well as other um, uh, patient groups around the world. Uh, and um, we were able to get an investigational new drug approval from the FDA uh, last year, and we're launching our clinical trial now. So the way that this trial will work um, is that we will um, anticipate having a diagnosis, a genetic diagnosis of the condition, um, either with um, the chorionic villus sampling or amniocentesis. Uh, and the FDA did give us uh, permission to treat a number of different disorders under the same clinical trial. So for the MPSs, uh, we'll be able to treat uh, fetuses with MPS 1, 2, 4A, 6, or 7. Uh, basically, all of these are the related diseases for which there's a postnatal FDA-approved enzyme replacement therapy that's given through the vein. We'll be giving the, the treatment through the umbilical vein every two to four weeks between 18 to 35 weeks of gestation. And then after birth, uh, the patients will get the standard of care. So standard enzyme replacement therapy. Um, and for conditions, if they were to get a stem cell transplant, they would also get that if, they, if the family chose to do that. Uh, and then we'll do a yearly follow-up for five years. So what are our endpoints? So it's important to keep in mind that this is a phase one clinical trial which means it's really the earliest uh, investigational uh, study. Uh, so we're really trying to just see whether this therapy is safe uh, and whether it's feasible to do. You know, are we going to even diagnose these patients uh, before birth? Uh, but of course, um, in order to do any clinical trial in the pediatric or fetal population, you have to have some hope also that you're going to improve um, the outcome. So although it's not a guarantee, we do hope to improve the outcomes um, uh, that are listed here one is uh, decrease the GAGs or the glycosaminoglycans, which are the toxic metabolic byproducts that build up uh, in tissues and, and you can uh, diagnose them in the urine. So we'll be looking for that. We'll be looking at whether we induce tolerance to the recombinant enzyme. And so are we preventing the formation of those anti-drug antibodies? Uh, and we'll also be looking at long-term outcomes, um, especially doing formal neurologic testing every year um, on the children. Um, to see if we've improved that. So for any uh, trial, it's important to uh, really understand who um, could participate in the trial. So these are the inclusion criteria. So it's uh, fetuses between 18 to 35 weeks gestation. Um, and this is really uh, partly practical and partly um, you know, based on the scientific rationale. Um, we're not really able to do a safe injection before 18 weeks gestation uh, in the fetus. The umbilical vein is too uh, challenging to find. Um, and uh, before 18 weeks, we don't anticipate most of the fetus would get diagnosed uh, anyhow. Uh, and then after 35 weeks gestation, uh, it doesn't make sense to do any other procedures. You might as well deliver uh, the child and, and, and uh, give the enzyme replacement after birth. And we definitely want to make sure that we have confirmed the presence of the lysosomal storage disease by uh, genetic testing, uh, either by CVS or amniocentesis. Um, and also that we've confirmed that that particular genotype um, is going to give us severe uh, enough disease so that it makes sense to treat before birth. Uh, and then there are also what we call exclusion criteria where we don't think it would be safe to enroll a patient 
Um, and those are patients that have any other major um, other problem, like a structural um, problem that we can see on ultrasound or a chromosome problem like Down syndrome or any other major genetic mutation. Uh, and also maternal conditions uh, that we just wouldn't make it safe to do the fetal intervention. So fetal surgery is a really unique field where we have two patients, right? We have the mother and the fetus, and we wanna make sure that maternal safety is, is really um, you know, paramount. Uh, and so we, we wanna make sure that if there's anything that's going to uh, make it too risky for the mother uh, to undergo the therapy that, that they uh, would not be included in the trial. So uh, the way that this, the trial will work is that um, if we have um, identify a fetus with an MPS uh, disease um, anywhere in the country um, or even the world, uh, we would do a video consultation uh, with the family um, and the physicians. Uh, we've all gotten really good at doing that through COVID. Uh, and then uh, if we think that they meet the inclusion criteria based on all the uh, pregnancy and genetic information that we have, uh, and if the parents are considering participating, uh, then we would invite them to UCSF for the evaluation. Uh, we do have funding for all of the travel and the screening uh, evaluation um, and the, the medical care involved with the, with the trial. Uh, and then uh, once we do the evaluation in person at UCSF, um, again, if we don't think that it's safe to enroll um, that patient, then they would be excluded, uh, but then we could still help with organizing the postnatal care. Uh, but that if they meet the inclusion criteria, uh, and they would like to be included um, and they would like to participate in the trial, uh, then we would do the in utero enzyme replacement therapy at UCSF. Uh, we do need to do the treatments at UCSF and we would repeat every two to four weeks because of the half-life of the enzyme. And we've had patients participating in other trials who either stay in San Francisco for the duration of the pregnancy or who um, fly back home in between the therapies um, because you, know, you definitely have uh, several weeks to go back and forth. And then delivery would be at home um, unless the family chose to stay in San Francisco and that would be the routine postnatal care. Uh, but then once a year, we would invite the family back to UCSF uh, to have the follow-ups, uh, some uh, neurological testing and other testing that would be uh, really monitored by Dr. Paul Harmatz, who's our um, expert here. Uh, and then uh, in conversations with the FDA, uh, we've uh, decided that uh, it's really important to do a long-term follow-up because this really is the first time that um, in utero enzyme replacement therapy would be given uh, for uh, MPS disease. So we would be looking uh, to see whether that we've induced tolerance uh, to the enzyme replacement therapy. Uh, we would be looking at the glycosaminoglycan levels. Those are the toxic metabolic byproducts. Uh, we would be looking at the mobility um, of the children uh, as they grow, uh, neurologic function, uh, as well as um, uh, growth. So for any uh, therapy, of course, it's really important to look at the risk benefit analysis. Uh, we've talked a lot about the potential benefits, uh, but what are some of the risks of participating in this therapy? So one potential risk is an allergic reaction. Um, we are hoping to induce tolerance, and that's what we've seen in, in any preclinical uh, animal study, uh, both with the enzyme replacement or um, introducing other proteins in utero. Uh, but, but there could be conversely an allergic reaction. Um, even a, a reaction in the mother uh, we think it's less likely because we are dosing directly into the fetus and it's a tiny dose compared to the mother's weight. Uh, but it's, uh, it's definitely something that we'll be monitoring very carefully for over time. Uh, bleeding is a risk of any procedure that you do anytime. Uh, and then the other risk is preterm labor. Um, we are injecting the medication directly into the umbilical vein. Uh, which as I mentioned, it's a common procedure that we do for blood transfusions, but it's definitely, um, you know, can be, uh, can be risky in unexperienced hands. Uh, this is how we do the procedure. It's un ultrasound guided. Um, and we have um, uh, Dr. Juan Gonzalez on our team uh, does all of our umbilical vein injections for transfusions and, and other medication administrations. Uh, we have uh, reviewed our experience um, in more than 100 uh, infusions, uh, and we've had no fetal loss, and the risk of preterm delivery is less than 5%. Uh, 
Um, but I think this is the most important risk to consider when you're um, considering participating in this trial. And it's important to really consider the feasibility um, of really doing accurate and timely prenatal diagnosis for patients with MPS diseases. Uh, we think that we're most likely to identify uh, fetuses in families who already have a known uh, carrier status, uh, perhaps a known affected child, uh, because we don't do universal screening during pregnancy for MPS or any lysosomal storage disease. Um, and we don't do the screening because we don't yet have a therapy. But of course, if you have a viable therapy, that changes the equation uh, for recommended screening. And with any new therapy, it's really important to engage the patient community. And uh, we have um, surveyed the, you, the MPS Society. Um, and so thank you uh, for participating in the survey. Uh, and uh, if you would like to fill out our survey, uh, please let me know. Uh, we've really been overwhelmed by the positive uh, reaction that we've seen uh, for this um, in utero enzyme replacement therapy trial. Uh, and so uh, just to give you some of the results, uh, when we surveyed 169 parents, really mostly parents, 90% parents, uh, and some patients with lysosomal storage diseases, um, on the likelihood of ending a future affected pregnancy, uh, the majority have said, uh, of, of our patients or parents said that that was unlikely, um, of choosing a fetal enzyme replacement therapy, if it were an established therapy, which, is, which it's not yet, of course, um, the majority of them said that they were likely. Uh, and then when we phrased it as, uh, would you enroll in a phase one clinical trial for fetal enzyme replacement therapy? So this is investigational, no guarantee of success. Um, again, the majority uh, said that they would be likely to enroll. So uh, in summary, our clinical trial is now open for en enrollment um, for uh, people um, really anywhere in the world. Um, and as I mentioned, we have funding to support the travel uh, to UCSF, uh, as well as the medical costs associated with the infusion. Uh, and if you would like more information, uh, please uh, let me know. You can email Billy, our genetic counselor, or myself. And uh, I wanna acknowledge the giant team of people um, who make this work possible, um, especially um, Dr. Harmatz, uh, who's uh, really our expert in lysosomal storage disorders, um, uh, as well as uh, Marissa Schwab, our surgery resident who uh, did a lot of incredible work on the FDA application and setting up the clinical trial. Uh, Billy, our genetic counselor, um, uh, Juan Gonzalez is our uh, maternal fetal medicine doctor who's uh, done a lot of work on the clinical protocol to make sure that uh, we're really um, acknowledging uh, safety for, uh, for mom and fetus. Uh, Renata is, our, is another uh, genetics expert. Uh, Teresa Sparks is another uh, uh, genetics expert. And Ramobia and Val are our program managers. Uh, so thank you. And I'll be uh, very excited to take any questions and interact with you. Thank you, Tippy, for what was a wonderful presentation. And this is an incredibly exciting clinical trial. I think we are all very excited about seeing it move forward, to seeing what kind of therapy it can bring to some of these diseases in utero and also to the issue of immune tolerance. Our next talk in this session on developments and improvement in clinical practice uh, and research comes from Dr. Troy Lund. Troy comes to us from the University of Pennsylvania, where he is a clinician working primarily in transplantation uh, for the MPS disorders, but he really exemplifies the best of a clinician scientist researcher. So he's interested in both benchtop uh, developments and how to bring them into relevant clinical practice. And he will talk to us about biomarkers for neuropathology in the MPS disorders. Again, make sure that you get us your questions, which we look forward to reviewing at the end of the session. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. It's really humbling to be asked by the National MPS Society uh, to give a talk. So I'm Dr. Troy Lund at the University of Minnesota. I'll be talking about uh, biochemical predictors in the blood or spinal fluid uh, of neurocognitive outcomes in Hurler syndrome. So really by this, I mean IQ. So how well were children with Hurler syndrome uh, perform an IQ test after transplant? 
So my disclosures are as follows. I've done some work with Sanofi Genzyme. I have uh, spoken for Takeda and in the past done some mouse research with Sanofi Genzyme. So what's the rationale for the therapy I'm gonna tell you about? Uh, because to know the outcomes, you know, we'll have to go over the therapy plan. So we used intrathecal uh, iduronidase, which is enzyme uh, being delivered to the spinal column. And the rationale was that during the workup and transplantation process, we thought it would provide a neuroprotective bridge prior to bone marrow transplant and engraftment. So what does transplant look like? What does the timing look like? Uh, and so there's the identification of a child with Hurley syndrome. This is either now done through newborn screen at birth or historically the median time to get to transplant was 16 months of age. So you have that time period. Then there's the identification and once you've identified the transplant path, we have identification of donors, uh, which takes about two weeks. We have a workup week for the child. Uh, then there's, uh, once you've committed to transplant, chemotherapy, which is seven to 10 days. You actually have the transplant itself for cell infusion. That takes an hour. Uh, then we have engraftment of the primary hematopoietic cells. That takes about three to four weeks in the hospital. And then we have this uh, theoretical engraftment or differentiation of the donor cells in the brain of the child with Hurler syndrome, which uh, by all guesses might take six to 18 months after transplant. So again, the rationale for delivering enzyme to the spinal column was to provide a neuroprotective bridge prior to transplant, because as you already realize that enzyme delivered peripherally, like is customary, really does not cross the blood brain barrier or reach the brain. Now I need to lay this out in a linear calendar so you know what I'm talking about. So this is our schedule. Pay attention to the blue dot, uh, pentagrams here. This is the delivery to enzyme three months prior to transplant, two weeks prior to transplant, three months after transplant, and six months after transplant. So this is the uh, intrathecal delivery or IT delivery of enzyme. Children were on a standard IV enzyme replacement about three months uh, before transplant and then to about eight weeks after transplant. Also important is uh, the IQ testing. So neuropsychology evaluation was done prior to transplant, then at six months, one year, and two years after transplant. The results I'm gonna show you heavily rely on just pre-transplant and two years. I'm not gonna show anything with six months or one year post-transplant. Enrollment on this study, 24 uh, Hurler patients, split, split between male and female. Median age was 11.2 months. 20 of them received four, all four doses of intrathecal enzyme. There are five deaths due to transplant related complications. And as a reminder, uh, we've spent our uh, career kind of describing the biomarkers in MPS, particularly Hurler syndrome. And we've described several of the biomarkers shown here uh, in the spinal fluid that are uh, highly upregulated in children with Hurler syndrome. They are MCP1, uh, IL-1 receptor antagonists, SDF1-alpha, and MIP1B. These are just examples of inflammatory biomarkers uh, that are highly upregulated in children with Hurler syndrome. Prior to this, it was not uh, as appreciated that Hurler syndrome is accompanied by a good amount of inflammation, both in the body and in the brain. We've also publishing, published the opening pressure of children with Hurler syndrome and its response to bone marrow transplant. The opening pressure is the pressure of the spinal fluid uh, when a child is at rest. And it's often a marker of inflammation. Uh, and we described that it was actually high uh, pre-transplant as shown in the leftmost dot here on average. And then as children went through the uh, IV and IT enzyme and transplantation, we measured the pressures at uh, the second, third and fourth time points. We actually saw a decrease uh, before uh, it leveled off. So again, opening pressure uh, has been described by us as a, as a biomarker that responds to transplant. 
Um, we've also described um, various uh, GAGs and GAG surrogates as biomarkers for transplant. In this article, we described one that was uh, correlating to IQs uh, in Hurler patients after transplant. I'll try to put a calendar up here for every slide I show just to remind us of when the enzyme was delivered to the spine and when the uh, testing was done. Um, so in this uh, XY graph, we see um, on the x-axis, a, a decrease in the non-reducing non end IOS6, which it's not important what the chemical structure is. It's really a gag surrogate. It's very sensitive. So we measured that uh, at time point at baseline and at the fourth time point. And then we just looked for its decrease. And many of the kids had a, had a 30 to 40 to 90% decrease in this gag surrogate. We plotted this against percent change in IQ score from baseline shown here to two years post transplant. And what you can see a very, there was a very linear correlation is that the further you drop the storage material uh, in this case, GAG or NRE, the better the IQ score was uh, compared to the baseline. And that makes some sense to us uh, because uh, the therapy is intended to drop GAG levels. Uh, and the more you dropped your GAG level, the better you performed. I'm going to talk about three new entities. Uh, one of them is spermine. Uh, spermine was uh, originally described uh, by the James Wilson's group on a high throughput metabolic screen of dog MPS spinal fluid. Uh, and they found a compound that was very high in Hurler dogs and it was low in, in, in normal dogs. They repeated this in spinal fluid of patients and found it was very high in Hurler patients uh, compared to normal, less high in Hurler Shea and uh, not elevated in Shea patients. So this was a potential biomarker for us to look at. Uh, we have also described a new type of biomarker, uh, BM652, uh, which is a trisaccharide. Again, the structure is not important, but we described this again as a surrogate to GAGs. It's extremely sensitive. Uh, and we published this a couple of years ago that this biomarker is also high in naive Hurler patients. And once they're treated, drops by uh, 30 to 80% in almost every child. So we were wondering if this biomarker would be a good correlate to IQ. And finally, uh, we took all of our samples at all time points and looked at all the chemical mediators in the spinal fluid through a 45 plex cytokinolyza. So we looked at all these different inflammatory mediators at one time. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them because uh, not all of them are important. Actually, very few of them are. Uh, just to say that this was our approach and we looked for correlations between their changes and, um, and um, gain in IQ. So let's look at spermine. So on the right, we have our calendar here to remind us when the enzyme was given to this uh, in the spinal column and when the IQ tests were performed. So uh, pre-transplant in two years. Then we looked um, at uh, the spermine levels in the CSF at four time points. That's the same four po time points that we were delivering enzyme. And you can see the spermine was very high to pre-therapy. And then after intrathecal and IV enzyme was started, dropped substantially and then kept falling further uh, after transplant. You can plot this uh, by individuals. Uh, so this is uh, each person uh, uh, as and their spermine levels. And as you can see between the first two time points, mosquitoes dropped uh, spermine levels substantially. And you can display that data as percent drop from time point one to two, time point one to three, time point one to four, the final time point. You can see most kids on average had a 75% drop uh, in spermine levels. But interestingly, when we tried to correlate this percent drop to IQ as we've done in articles past, uh, we don't see a linear correlation. Uh, it's definitely not positive. It's not significant uh, and the line is a little bit negative. So the, there was no correlation between the amount of spermine you, uh, you lowered and any IQ point gain. Um, and again, that's probably due to that most of the kids actually dropped spermine levels substantially, but it didn't correlate to any IQ point gain. 
Let's move on to the, the other marker I talked about, the BM652 trisaccharide. Again, the calendar is on the bottom so we can remind ourselves of the sampling time uh, and um, the uh, IQ assessments. So in the whole group of patients, they started out with high levels that went down after IT and IV enzyme, went back went back just up a little at three months post transplant uh, and then normalized or not normalized but but uh, our fourth time point kind of looks like the second time point so there was some response to therapy uh, within each patient you can see that most patients dropped between time point one and time point two um, and then went up a little bit so again, you can look at this in terms of percent drop. So uh, most patients had a 25% uh, drop from time point one to two, uh, and then a further drop uh, from time point one to three, and then um, re kind of about the same from time point one to four as it was from one to two. Then we again looked at the difference uh, in IQ point gain. So comparing the baseline IQ test to the IQ test two years out, was there any correlation between points gained and that percent drop in this trisaccharide? It turns out there is a, a some linearity, some positive correlation. So the greater you dropped, uh, the more points you gained, but the p-value was not significant. Uh, so it didn't meet stand, uh, scientific standards to, to call this a, a true gain in IQ points with this biomarker. Uh, but at least there was some positive correlation. I just want to comment briefly, briefly about some cytokines and some some patterns I saw without going through all of them. Interleukin-1 is an inflammatory cytokine that we measured in the spinal fluid at time points one, two, three, and four. And what we see is that it, they didn't respond much uh, between the first and second time points. So two doses of intrathecal enzyme plus IV enzyme. After the third time, but actually went up quite a bit in many patients. And this is three months post-transplant, and then it went back down towards uh, the first time point by the fourth time point. This is probably due to the fact that the transplant itself involves chemotherapy and is very um, uh, probably inflammatory to children for a brief period of time, probably rated at 100 days post-transplant um, uh, before uh, the transplant takes its to effect, true effect by at least six months, uh, if not further out. But we didn't sample anybody further than six months. Uh, I want to show this again with interferon alpha, another inflammatory cytokine that, again, was the, about the same between time point one and two. Uh, it went up a little bit at time point three um, before coming back down at time point four. Um, and again, this is evident here. Um, and I, I did look for a correlation again. Um, let's look at the percent uh, drop in interferon alpha. And you can see on average, there wasn't much of a drop between one and two. And a negative drop from one to time point three, three months post-transplant is actually an increase in interferon gamma or interferon alpha. Uh, and then at time point four, you can see overall, there's not much of a change, but very interestingly, uh, when you uh, plot that percent drop on a patient by patient level, according to the IPQ points gained, uh, between uh, baseline and two months, you do find a correlation. Uh, and so the children that uh, drop this inflammatory cytokine the most gain the most IQ points, uh, while those that did not decrease this inflammatory, sorry, inflammatory cytokine did not gain uh, IQ points. And this value was actually, actually significant. So that was an interesting correlation. Now I want to turn uh, just to two other cytokines about uh, from that whole 45 plex I discussed that were very interesting and, and uh, significant. Uh, one is EGF, epidermal growth factor in the spinal fluid. We plotted the absolute values at time point four. So this is this time point six months post transplant. And then we looked at the, so those values are picograms per mil. And then we looked at IPQ points gained again at two years post-transplant um, uh, compared to baseline. And so what we found was very interesting is that the absolute value of this cytokine, uh, the higher it was, then more IQ points one gained. And what's interesting is that the assessment was done six months post-transplant and the IQ test was done 18 months later. So this value somewhat correlated with the IQ point uh, the child was destined to get. And this value was highly significant at uh, 0.005.
And I just want to show you one more uh, very interesting uh, cytokine, CCL20, uh, and it's absolute level. So picograms per mil in the spinal fluid, again, it's at time point four, six months post-transplant, and it's IQ points gained by two years compared to baseline. And this is an astounding correlation, in my opinion, that most of these dots line right up on this line. And in fact, um, it, what it tells me is that the higher the level of CCL20 at six months, the more you know, IQ points were destined to be gained in that child at two years, which is pretty uh, interesting if you think about this is just a chemical mediator at some concentration of spinal fluid to have it correlate to IQ point performance. Uh, gain performance on a test. IQ performance or points gained on the test is is really interesting. Uh, the tying to the tying of biological phenomena to uh, neurocognitive is is interesting and, and was our goal from this study. Uh, what is this cytokine? Um, well, it's it's LARC or it's MIP3A, and it uh, is in a family of cytokines, and it is responsible for many things, uh, inflammation, but it's attractive to cells, so it can bring cells to sites of high concentration. So perhaps it was responsible for bringing cells into the brain and those donor cells produced more enzyme and it, uh, allowed the kids to have better correction and they perform better in IQ tests. That's just um, a hypothesis. Um, that's about the one thing I could come up with uh, from data that looks like this. And now I can just summarize all the cytokine data uh, at once. CCL20 is listed at the top. The R square value is very high, highly significant. EGF uh, was the other one I showed you. Then there are a few others that did not perform as well uh, when I when I graphed them, uh, but they were significant. I thought I'd list them here, but by and far the most impressive one was CCL20. And again, the CCL20 level predicted 18 months prior. Uh, the IQ point change on, on testing for the Hurler child. So in summary, uh, CSF biomarkers have a pattern of expression with therapy. That's, that's what I showed you. Uh, CSF biomarkers, spermine and BM652, dropped substantially after uh, transplant, but these drops did not necessarily correlate uh, positively with uh, IQ point gain. CSF concentration of select cytokines at six months after transplant can be linked to IQ point gains or losses at 24 months post-transplant. So these, the measurement of those cytokines uh, preceded the IQ change by 18 months, which suggests maybe they're somewhat predictive, uh, if at least not correlative. Uh, and again, the direct concentration of CCL20 in the CSF predicted number of IQ points gained 18 months later. So now what? <clears throat> well, some of these results can be easily explained, uh, others less so. Um, you know, the drop in GAGs and NREs uh, and BM652, one would expect GAGs to drop after enzyme therapy and a transplant because that's uh, the whole goal of the process. Whether or not they correlate to IQ, I guess, um, is what we tried to test here. And in this case, BM652 didn't quite make the cut. Um, now, how a specific cytokine level correlates to an IQ point gain suggests to me that there's an individualized homeostatic mechanism at play for each child. Child, and that each child perhaps has its own uh, set of um, cytokine levels and that the uh, child responds to the therapy in such a manner that allows us to uh, predict how they'll respond um, if we measure uh, these cytokine levels. I don't have a better explanation for that uh, as of yet. And again, perhaps higher amounts of inflammation lead to better brain engraftment, leading to better enzyme secretion in the brain, which leads to better performance in IQ. Uh, a lot of that is, is really just theory or conjecture, but it's one of the things um, I can postulate given this data. And again, it's, it's, it's very interesting because um, if you think about how could how is it possible that the raw concentration of a chemical in the spinal fluid directly correlates to an IQ test? Um, it, it opens up a lot of different avenues and ex, uh, experiments for us to perform and things to do and measure in the future. So this couldn't have been done without my uh, team at the University of Minnesota, uh, especially Dr. Julie Eisengard, who's our uh, uh, expert in neuropsychology, performing all these tests, uh, the transplant team, Dr. Orchard and Dr. Gupta, 
Dr. Gupta and um, the rest of my colleagues um, around the country. Uh, thank you so much again for the invitation uh, and I'm happy to take questions during the question and answer period. Welcome back uh, to the question and answer period. Thank you so much, uh, Tippy and Troy, for incredibly good presentations. These are very exciting uh, projects and results. Uh, there, uh, I'll wait for some of the questions to, to roll in, but I have one for you right off the top of my head, Troy. Uh, the results that you presented on the CCL20, the way I understood it is, you think that that is directly related to a transplantation approach to therapy. Is that correct? Troy, you may be muted. I don't know if others can hear you. Let's try Tippy. Tippy, do you make better? There we go. Now? I can hear you okay. now. Yeah. Had to get to the right screen. Um, you know, I, I've thought about this a lot. I think it's mostly a transplantation effect, but the entire therapeutic uh, package was offered as a package. So all patient, most all patients were naive. They all started out IV enzyme, then intrathecal enzyme, and then got the transplant three months later. So there were three um, modalities to treatment, but probably the, the one with the longest lasting effect would have been the transplant because the IV and IT enzyme would have been discontinued. Uh, one of the things I find most exciting about these results is the fact that they are so predictive out to 18 months. And especially as we move forward and try to refine therapies for some of the diseases where the central nervous system disease has been intractable like San Filippo or Hunter syndrome, having a, a biomarker in the future that could give us a lead uh, would be wonderfully valuable. Yeah, definitely agree. Tippy, your results and your, your approach to therapy is so very exciting. Uh, one of the things that I am curious to know is what do you, what do you, would be your prediction on the immunological effect? Do you expect a pretty straightforward tolerization of these infants to the recombinant enzyme? Yeah, uh, thank you, Matthew. That's a, that's a great question. We, we saw a very clear result in our preclinical mouse study uh, where we saw that um, the, the mice injected in utero were um, uniformly tolerized. Um, obviously, the only way to really, um, really understand it is to do the study. There isn't um, a lot of uh, knowledge about, um, you know, tolerance after, in, you know, in utero exposure in humans. Uh, but there's a lot of literature on tolerance after in utero uh, exposure in non-human primates uh, using gene therapy and stem cell transplantation. Uh, and those studies have also shown tolerance. So we're quite hopeful that the in utero exposure uh, should prevent or attenuate the formation of anti-drug antibodies. That's excellent. And, uh, and I know that among some researchers and clinicians, the idea that there is a larger group of, for example, MPS7 patients that may not come to clinical attention because they uh, die in utero or in the early neonatal period from non-immune hydrops phallus, the potential to capture these and to get them on treatment is a particularly exciting aspect uh, to the, the trial. Troy, I wanted to throw out uh, sort of a question to you. It's uh, difficult to think about getting an FDA-approved biomarker. What, in your mind, would be if you could order up the perfect biomarker of central nervous system disease prediction, what would its uh, abilities have and what would be the best roadmap to get that approved, do you think, as something that could validate a clinical trial? Right. It's, it's been a long road for, for the FDA and for any of us in the field to try to unravel that. Uh, 
you know, they have a lot of comments about biomarkers, but they must be proven biomarkers, proven surrogates. And the only way we can do it is really through uh, natural history studies. But sadly, that really doesn't exist for MPS-1 anymore because everyone is getting some sort of treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the next best thing, I think, are studies like uh, ours and, and other uh, investigators around the country where we're at least collecting samples and trying to do those correlates. This is the first time at least we have a, a sample collection that predates a readout, in this case, as you mentioned, by 18 months. And so in many ways, that's the kind of biomarker you want is you do a sampling, you let time go by. And in this disease, usually that, that order of time is often months to years. And then you do your, your readout, either it's a, a, a neurologic readout of some type, a motor readout or uh, a neurocognitive readout. And so if one can tie those together with statistical significance and actually a good relationship between the data points, i.e. that R, R squared value is very important, not just a p-value, um, then that's the kind of biomarker that I think moves forward. I know one of the uh, issues that plagues my imagination is that we know, for example, in MPS-1, there's a window of therapeutic opportunity for bone marrow transplantation to address the most significant central nervous system disease. And there also may be biomarkers that really track the innate biology of the response to therapy. So I can envision a situation where a biomarker could show a response to therapy, but not necessarily a clinical uh, meaningful result in terms of behavior or cognition, because we've passed a window of opportunity, as it were. Um, there is work being done, I know, in some of the mouse model work using neurofilament light chain as a biomarker. Have you had any experience with that as a predictor for central nervous system disease? Uh, yeah, um, we haven't done it in MPS yet. We've just finished analyzing 50 or 60 patients with cere cerebral adrenal leukodystrophy and uh, found a great, uh, found its great utility as a biomarker, not only to the extent of disease, but response to therapy. And it, it's a very popular, I guess, biomarker right now. Um, everybody's testing for it. And I think the next thing we need to do is, is just take our same MPS samples, which are still around, and, and see if it actually holds true for a disease like MPS as well. So that'll be next on the docket. Tippy, since I've been talking about biomarkers, I wanted to shift this over to you. I know one of the things you're going to be looking at uh, would be uh, GAGs and then, of course, the immune profile of the infants. Are you looking to address any other sort of more comprehensive approach to biomarkers as part of your study? Yeah, great question. So we will be looking at GAGs uh, both um, in the fetal blood at each time of in utero enzyme infusion, <clears throat> excuse me, because we have to draw back a little bit of blood to make sure that we're in the vein, um, as well as in the amniotic fluid and the cord blood and in the child's urine after birth. Uh, we'll also be looking at things like um, cardiac function, the extent of cardiomyopathy as we see on echoes, uh, both done before birth and after birth. Uh, we'll be doing a complete neurocognitive evaluation, including IQ testing and Vineland scores. Uh, and so we hope to uh, put together a complete picture um, of the effect of the enzyme replacement therapy. Uh, and you know, we anticipate that in many cases, these will be children and families where there's a sibling, an older sibling who did not have in utero therapy, of course, and so we can we can have a, sort of an, an internal control there. Excellent. That sounds like a very comprehensive approach and one that will yield a great deal of uh, important information. And I hope that you get fully enrolled for as many of the diseases as uh, you are able to treat. I'm going to watch this with great excitement. Thank you. Uh, Troy, I have to follow up as a, uh, a former researcher using veterinary models. Does your trisaccharide, uh, should it work for both dermatan and heparin sulfate, or is it specific to one of the GAGs versus the other? Yeah, I, I think it was more specific towards the heparin sulfate. 
So theoretically, it may work for uh, any of the San Filippo disorders unless it had some non-reducing aspects that were shared with iduronidase deficiency. Correct, it could. We haven't tested it in that way, but uh, it's actually a very good idea. Well, I have a colleague uh, who's not far south of you who I expect is probably watching right now and may be interested in trying to uh, get you some samples to evaluate in the San Filippo dog. That would be a really valuable tool. Oh, yeah. Look forward to it. As we get ready to wind up, uh, I cannot see any more questions, but I'd like to open it up to either of you if you'd like to say anything. And um, otherwise, I will do a preview for next week, and we will uh, be on our way. Any concluding remarks from either of you? No, I had a, I had a great time. It's been a great day, and the sessions are all very informative for myself uh, still to this day. I, I learned a ton for this meeting. And one thing I wanted to say is just thank you to the families and thank you, Matthew, for um, helping us with the survey on, um, you know, responsiveness to in utero therapy, because I think, um, you know, any therapy that any of us develops is, is really rooted in, um, in what the patients and families think. So it's, uh, it's been incredibly uh, rewarding to, to see the positive response that we have from the community and really looking forward to working with you more in the future. Thank you, Tippy. I can remember the first family conference I attended uh, and the, the sense of fellowship that having families at conferences brought to the researchers especially. It was one of the things that made me very clear in my mind that I wanted to be in this field. It is such a wonderfully uh, congenial and collegial group of researchers. And I, I think one, we're, we're good people and we're drawn to the mission of this field but I think also we're grounded in uh, with the families in trying to deliver therapies and research and science that will improve those therapies. So thank you both for wonderful talks. Uh, I would like to remind those listening that we will have another scientific session next Sunday. We'll have an hour uh, uh, each for three different sessions. We're going to be discussing especially important innovations in Hunter syndrome, We'll have uh, an hour on improved methods to phenotype hunter mutations in model systems. Uh, this was uh, initiatives uh, funded by the National MPS Society. We have some exciting work, one from your colleague, uh, Troy Egren Estrasel at Minnesota, and then a zebrafish researcher from Italy will be talking on developments in both basic neurobiology and neurodevelopment, as well as a disease of Hunter syndrome. And then we'll follow up with a recap from our scientific advisory board chair, Linda Polgren and her colleague, uh, Nicolina Iacovino on the immune inflammation aspects of MPS disease. And then our chair designate, Kim Hemsley from Australia, will be coming to us with an overview of neuropathology in the MPS disorders. So I hope everyone will join us next Sunday. And without further ado, I will wrap up our session. And I thank you, Troy and uh, Tippy, very much for joining us today.